All right, hello everyone. Welcome to our March Educator Educators webinar. Uh, our topic this month is focusing on financial aid deferment. Uh, we do have our great guest speaker here today, Sandy Larson, is one of our scholarship coordinators No college. They will be going over more of the institutional side of financial aid deferment, and then near the end, I will follow up with more of the federal aid uh, portion of financial aid deferment. Um, with that being said, go ahead, Sandy, and get us going. Right. So um, before I really go into Snow's um, policy for scholarship deferment and going through withdrawals and things, just know that each institution has their own way of doing things. Um, so if your students are going to other institutions, they are going to have their own way to do it and that you'll need to check into it per institution. But I'll kind of take you through how we do it here at Snow. Um, students can um, postpone their education um, before they get here. Um, it's called deferment uh, for scholarships and admission. Um, we have our, they have to have their way of, um, sorry, a little nervous. Um, we, they have to have a real reason why they're taking off, taking a break. Um, our acceptable reasons here at Snow are military service, uh, medical reasons, church service, um, such as a church mission. There are humanitarian missions as well. Um, and there are other circumstances that we do consider, but they are on a case-by-case -case basis. The biggest reason we do not accept deferments is taking a break to work. Um, this is usually uh, across the board throughout the state. Um, it's not an acceptable reason. There might be extenuating circumstances that will be considered. Um, but, but for the most part, if a student is just wanting to take a break uh, to work, it is not an acceptable reason and their scholarship and admissions won't be on hold to do that. Common documentation um, for these reasons that we accept to defer, uh, doctor's notes, um, counselor notes, it's not necessarily high school counselor unless they know of a home situation where um, they can vouch for the student and their reasons. Um, anything coming from a counselor needs to be on official letterhead or it won't be accepted. Um, mission call letters, military deployment papers or training papers, um, like therapist notes, anything that can give us an official reason that this student shouldn't be enrolled in school right now is something that we will take into consideration. So our deferral process starts with our leave of absence form. Um, you can find our leave of absence form on our Snow College website. Once that leave of absence gets into the, our system, it goes directly to the scholarship office and to the admissions office. And from there, we will need the documentation to support the reason for deferral. Um, here at Snow, our financial aid office and our scholarships office are very closely linked. So if you get it to one, it's going to get to both um, because we're just right by each other. Um, students who are deferring, it is highly suggested that they fill out our release of student information form. It's the FERPA release um, that will help give their parents or guardians or whoever they're choosing um, access to their student accounts while they're gone. Um, institutions here, um, our institutional policy, and I think it's across the board statewide, is five semesters or 32 months. Sorry, I did see that yesterday and didn't go through that. Um, so up to 32 months. That is the longest that they can do. If they accept or defer once and don't use all of their time, technically they can come and defer a second time for a credible reason and they can use the remaining time, but it, it does not reset the up to five semesters. That is a total for the use of their scholarship or their admissions here at Snow. If their um, time lapses, their scholarship or their admissions, um, they have to reapply for admissions and pay that admission fee. Um, that's what the deferment does as far as admissions goes is 
makes it so they don't have to pay the admission fee to read admit um, but for scholarships it actually just voids their academic scholarships so it's a a good thing to make sure that they know if they lapse that five semester time frame that their scholarship is just gone Sorry. there is a deadline to defer um, they have to defer by the first day of the semester that they plan on deferring um, and then they have until the last day of that same semester to turn in their documentation. Um, so it does give them that couple month gap if say they're waiting for their mission call to get here um, to get us their mission call letter. But we have to have that letter before the last day of the semester or their deferral is not complete and their scholarship was not deferred. So the difference between withdrawal and deferment. Um, withdrawal usually happens at some point during the semester and deferrals start before the semester begins. So with the withdrawal, um, they have, for the first three weeks, they can withdraw without much financial responsibility on the student's part. Um, after the third week, they're pretty much responsible for as far as they make it into the semester. So there will be a calculation done by the financial aid office um, to see how far they've made it into the semester. And that's how much tuition they're gonna owe, how much financial aid actually gets removed from their account and that they're gonna owe back. Um, so with deferral, uh, they are still responsible financially for at least part of the semester. Um, obviously there are exceptions to that rule um, depending on the circumstances for their withdrawal and they um, will be taken to the financial relief committee uh, with those circumstances and they will decide how much of the semester that student is responsible for financially. Um, with deferment, they are not charged obviously because they didn't start the semester. Their stuff is just put on pause, but withdrawal, uh, it just depends on where they're at in the semester and the process that they will need to go through. For the first three weeks of the semester, it's easier to withdraw. Um, they still have to go through the advisor's office um, and they can withdraw partially just from a couple of classes. They're pretty easy to drop, but withdrawing completely, um, there is a withdrawal form that they can find on our Snow College website and they will have to do it with their advisor. It's not just something that they can do on their own. Um, let's see. So once they have their withdrawal form complete, completely taken care of, depending on where they're at in the semester, they might have to get professors to sign it. They might have to just go through their advisors and their advisors can drop everything if they're at closer to the beginning of the semester. Um, then once that process is done, they have to take it to the registration office and the registration actually is the one that will withdraw them from their classes. Can I ask you a quick question on yeah. kind of withdrawal versus deferral? Are the extenuating circumstances usually pretty similar or are they typically different reasons why you would withdraw versus why you would defer? Um, a lot of the time that they withdraw where these circumstances are really taken into consideration is um, if there's like a death in the family or some severe medical reason, if they're, they all of a sudden have cancer and cannot be here, or if a family member does, um, or if they have a mental health issue and they are just not safe to be in school. These are reasons that are taken into consideration as far as what they're going to owe for the semester. So we do encourage students to make sure that they are in contact with us. Sorry, there's a vacuum going. I'm sure you can hear that. Um, with, our, with the financial aid and scholarship office and the admissions, um, the financial aid, like I said, is really closely connected here at Snow. So if they call the financial aid office, they will get stuff to the scholarship office. Um, as long as we know where, where you're at on our leave of absence form, it actually gives you an area to list how long they're planning on being gone. Um, but as long as they're in that five semester, 32 month window, they can update 
how long they're going to be gone. If they're only planning on being gone two years and something happens, they may need to be gone a little bit longer than that. They just need to let us know and we can keep things updated. Um, they do need to make sure that they have read their scholarship contracts and their admissions stuff just to make sure that they're still meeting those criteria. And if they're not, um, all they need to do is contact us and we can help them figure out where they're at and what they need to do. Um, Snow is really easy to help you work through things. Um, that's something that we definitely pride ourselves on is making sure that we will help that student to the most of their abilities and make sure that they're doing things as closely to how they need to as possible. I think at the end, um, if you have any questions for me, we can go through that. Is that the way we're doing that? Okay, perfect. I think I'm done. All right, so I'm gonna take over here for the rest of the time with Sandy. I did want to echo one thing, uh, one really important thing that Sandy mentioned earlier is that each institution has slightly different rules. And so when you are working with a student, please do reach out to the respective financial aid office that they're at the institution they plan on attending and verify some of this information. This is just a great way, um, not only for you to learn about how Snow College does it, but in general, how the process works. So that being said, we're gonna start looking more immediate. So for the senior year of your high school students, students should still apply for admissions and scholarships, even if they plan on deferring. Um, we also highly recommend that they still fill out the FAFSA as part of admissions and most of the time scholarships, uh, FAFSA need or um, financial aid need is usually computed based off of the FAFSA and it's used um, in determining eligibility for scholarships. So it's really important, even if the student knows they are going on a mission or going on a peacekeeping mission um, at any time, you know, in the near future, that they still out, fill out the FAFSA. One other thing that we kind of saw, especially during the last two years during COVID is plans tend to change a little bit. Um, and so filling out the FAFSA is just kind of that surefire way that if plans change and they want to continue um, in higher ed, they don't have to scramble through the FAFSA or be waiting on a, a couple of things um, for admissions or scholarships. They can just kind of jump right in and go. All right, so now we're gonna talk about Title IV funds. So Title IV funds are basically the federal student aid that's administered by the Department of Education um, that help pay for things such as tuition, uh, mandatory fees, and sometimes room and board. Some of the, the examples of Title IV funds that you're probably familiar with are direct subsidized and unsubsidized loans, graduate plus loans, uh, parent plus loans, and the Pell Grant. One thing that we do need to, to make sure that students understand if they do take out federal funds, such as the Pell Grant before going on deferment, um, student loans are deferred while they are in school. And once they have left for any reason um, for six consecutive months, whether that's just taking a break, going on deferment, um, military service does not uh, count toward, against that, but they do typically go into a repayment period there. Um, sometimes we see this when some students like to get, you know, one semester or a full year of, of higher ed done before they go on, say, a mission um, or join the Peace Corps or anything like that. And so it's, it's important to understand um, that some repayment may be necessary. Uh, we do see that if you work with your student loan provider, even if it's through a direct subsidized loan, um, you are able to work with the loan service provider and they can usually make changes and allow you to just say make interest payments or no payments at all um, while you're on deferment. So we're gonna talk about how deferment affects financial aid. So obviously student loans, student loans that have already been accepted and paid to the institution 
um, will not be canceled. That money will have already gone through. But if you received uh, student loans for the entire year and are only attending the one semester before deferment, that second part um, will not be dispersed. It'll be canceled. Um, the same thing comes for our Parent PLUS loans. So the parent loan and undergraduate student uh, again, all that money that has not yet been dispersed will be canceled. Uh, this one is important to note that loan repayment begins when the student has been out of school for 60 consecutive days. And this is where we usually recommend having um, the student fill out their FERPA with uh, a guardian or parent. That way they can have information on their school and still have um, the ability to pay for some loans or have ways to defer that amount. Um, Pell Grants is one of the big things I wanted to focus on today. So Pell Grants are awarded on an ap academic year basis and they're paid out on a semester or quarterly basis. So same as all the rest funds that have been accepted but not yet dispersed will be canceled. Um, this is just kind of a little graphic that kind of explains how this works. So the total grant award for a Pell Grant can be 6250. That gets broken out into two semesters, your fall and spring semester. If the student happens to defer halfway through, they will still have gotten the Pell Grant for the fall before they deferred and then will not receive that federal Pell Grant for the spring semester. Um, sometimes we'll see, just depending on timelines, Students, if they filled out the FAFSA, will come back from deferment, but they won't be able to get that fall section because they were still on deferment, but start up again in the spring. And so at that point, they can only get half of what the federal uh, Pell Grant is, which would be that 3125. So deferment for eligibility for loans is pretty similar to what uh, deferment is at institutions, but there are some um, different options. So undergoing cancer treatment or a, a prolonged treatment series. One of our next ones is economic hardship. Um, usually the federal government recommends going on a payment plan instead of utilizing this option. Not only will you still likely be required to continue paying towards the loans that you had taken out, um, but by doing it through the uh, payment plan, it's based on a percentage of income, um, whether you're serving like in the Peace Corps or any other uh, AmeriCorps type program, your income will be a little bit lower and sometimes programs like that will cover interest or deferment costs. Uh, graduate fellowship, we see this a lot for our students who are looking into the medical field. Usually while they're in their fellowship, they don't have to pay on their loans just as if they were still in school um, obtaining their uh, doctorate degree. Um, the big one that most of us are aware of is while students are in school at least half time, um, they don't, they defer on all their loans, federal loans that is, um, and they don't have to pay back uh, principal amounts depending on what kind of federal loan they may still be um, accruing interest, uh, as we mentioned earlier. Uh, deferment for military service, usually in, in this aspect, a lot of um, principal and interest are taken care of um, for the students so they don't have to pay on those while they are active duty or in training. And then deferment eligibility um, for rehabilitation training, um, usually, again, that is more of a principal amount that they are deferring but interest uh, charges may still apply. And that is pretty much everything we have. So while you are coming up with questions for Sandy or myself, uh, we do have this little QR code here. We do like to ask you to fill that out. That helps us figure out what um, topic we should cover next month and what days and times work. Nick, can I just add a little something about the Pell Grant? Yeah, go ahead. Um, just so everybody knows, um, the way that financial aid is determined is off of 
income and household size and number in college. Um, so not everybody is eligible for Pell Grant and not everybody is eligible to the same extent. Um, so the, the number that you had on your slide is for people that are fully eligible. Um, and it's also determined by the number of credits that they're enrolled in. So they would have to be fully enrolled um, full time to receive the full amount of Pell Grant. Yeah, thank you for making that clarification, Sandy. I was just going to ask, um, could you dive a little bit more into that student release form and maybe some common examples that you encounter um, when it comes to students doing that? Was that for me or for Nick? Yeah, that was for you, Sandy. <laughs> okay. okay, sorry, you repeat that one more time. Um, can you just dive a little bit more into the, the student release form that they uh, they do for um, yeah, so, the process um, and maybe, in my com maybe some common examples that you encounter? Of why students filled the, out the FERPA release form? Yeah. Um, so for us, the main reason that um, students have that filled out is so their parents are able to have that information or we're able to talk to their parents. Um, once they are admitted to the college, we pretty much cannot divulge any information to the parent unless they've signed that for release or unless they are with their child and that child can give verbal permission. And that only counts for the time that we're on the phone with them. Um, so having that for release is actually really beneficial, especially um, right now, parents want to do everything for their child. Um, so having that FERPA release makes it so we're actually able to help instead of causing frustration on both ends. Awesome, thank you. Did that answer your question? Yeah, that was great. Okay. Another question just came in from Karen. Um, if a student isn't enrolled full time, uh, oops, got another question. Um, are the eligible, are they eligible to receive part of the Pell Grant or are the funds from the Pell Grant only available if they are enrolled for 12 credits or more? So Pell Grant pays out per credit. So they can be enrolled in three credits and still be eligible for a portion of the Pell Grant that they are eligible for. Um, like I said before, it does. it is completely based on the financial aid calculations, um, how much they're eligible for, but it is per credit. And then another question. Um, from Katie, I have a question about withdrawal. Let's say a student got at least some Pell money and then withdrew halfway through the semester. If they don't have the money to pay as a lump sum, does the college offer an installment plan for repayment? Yes, um, they will set up payment plans for the student to pay back whatever they're, oh, whatever they're owing. Um, we use a company called Nailnet for our payment plans. And they, depending on where they're at in the semester, um, is how many payments they can go through. Um, it, it's different depending on where they're at, how many payments they're able to do, how far they're able to spread those payments out. Great, thank you so much for that. Vicki just asked another question. If a student is eligible for FAFSA Pell Grant and plans to go on one semester, then go on a church mission. You said the second semester payout will be canceled. Does the student just need to defer the university and then the FAFSA automatically is canceled? Or does the student have to do anything to defer that FAFSA or federal money as well? So FAFSA needs to be filled out annually. Um, so as far as that second semester being canceled, um, it's it doesn't affect, I mean, it's just canceled. They'll still have to re- fill out the FAFSA to come back, say, a year later. Um, it is an annual thing, but like Nick said, um, it is that great backup if their plans change and all of a sudden they're coming to school that they'll have that safety net for that annual year. So it's kind of like a, a, it's a automatic kind of process since they won't yes. be there for the next semester, but they do still need to reach out if they've got loans to their service provider because right. that's kind of more separate. Great question. I, I will add with, with that one is when things such as grants are distributed to a student, 
they go to the institution first. Mm -hmm. And so the institution kind of has the bird's eye view on what the what student um, is eligible for in terms of the Pell Grant. And so it's not necessarily that the FAFSA is canceled. It's just that that second half of the money just won't be dispersed to the student as they're not enrolled full time. And then we had an off the subject question come up from Amy. Um, Amy has a student that's going to snow. We just got a message saying she needed to submit satisfactory academic progress form to get the financial aid, but hasn't started college yet. Do you have any advice? <laughs> um, so that form is actually um, basically their contract with the federal government saying that they're planning on going on their into their classes. They're planning on passing at least 70% of them and keeping their grades above a 2.0. So it doesn't matter that they haven't had any college experience yet. It is a form that they will have to sign each year, um, basically renewing their contract with the federal government to meet those requirements to be eligible for financial aid. She says thank you. <laughs> um, while we're waiting for any more questions, I was curious um, on the college or institutional side, is there any major items that you wish you would be able to inform our professionals that are assisting these students as they're, you know, possibly deferring um, that, you know, maybe you can advise to say or give them tips of what, what's a major common thing that, that would be helpful on their end um, in that transition to deferment? Make sure that um, students realize that they have to turn in some kind of documentation or their for deferral is not complete. Um, we see it all the time where a student filled out the leave of absence form, but they forgot to turn in the documentation. So they're thinking that they have their process all done when really it was never completed and their scholarship was never placed on hold or their admissions yeah. were never placed on hold because they didn't complete that process. And early, um, the earlier they can do it, the better. I know um, our scholarship deadline just passed and we're getting calls like, I didn't know I needed to do it that early. Um, so anything that you can do early with deferment, with scholarships, with anything, um, it gives you more time to have wiggle room. If you've started that process, it gives you more time to complete that process. Um, so you're not frantic. So tell your kids to make sure that they're aware of deadlines and that they need to do it earlier than they're thinking. Uh, thank you for that. And just to follow up with that, do all colleges kind of require this type of documentation when it comes to deferment? Um, I think as far as scholarships go, yes. Um, not necessarily for admissions in a lot of colleges, but um, where we do have legitimate reasons that are acceptable to defer there needs to be that documentation to make sure it's actually one of those reasons. 